الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على صلاة حي على صلاة حي على الفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد وبعد من نور الله most gracious most merciful verily our praise and glory is due to Allah we praise Allah and we say alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we seek Allah's constant assistance in all of our affairs and we beg for his forgiveness whenever we commit errors or sin we repent to him whenever we violate whenever we transgress and we acknowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed our Lord and our sustainer and our creator we acknowledge that Allah is therefore worthy of all worship. This is why we say, La ilaha illallah. And we acknowledge that Allah Ta'ala sent His beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for the well-being of all mankind. And Allah Ta'ala instructed the Prophet to say this to people. The Prophet ﷺ was instructed to tell people that he was sent for the well-being of all mankind. In the Quran, Allah Ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا So whenever a verse in the Quran starts out with قُلْ, like قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ, قُلْ this is instruction to the Prophet that he himself first must say this. He must declare it. And this is evidence that the Prophet was indeed carrying out the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not his own agenda. Because Allah would time, from time to time say to him, Qul. Say, O people. Whenever Allah refers to Anas in the Quran as the majority of the ulama, the commentators on the Quran, ulama tafsir, 
amongst them Ibn Kathir rahmatullah alayhi, they say, هذه للناس عامة. This statement is for people. Kafir, Muslim, in between, all of the, the people need to hear this. And what is the message? إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Verily, I am the messenger of Allah to you all. So the message of Muhammad وسلم, is not Muslim specific. It's not something that is just for you. It's not something that's just for me. It is something that is for everyone. And when we are blessed by Allah to have guidance, then we have an obligation of sorts to share. Because guidance is enlightenment. And Allah Ta'ala says about scripture, فِيهِ هُبًا وَنُورٍ To the characteristics of scripture, beginning for the Muslim with the Qur'an, is that it contains huban, which is guidance, wanuru, which is light. So you can know the way, you can see the way. And this light is a spiritual light. It's a spiritual light that opens up the human being to the reality of what life is about. The Prophet Sallallahu this message is his message and this message is for everyone and not just for the Muslims. So the Muslims who want to hold on to Islam as if it is their personal possession as opposed to Islam being a tremendous gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need to rethink that position because when Allah gives you this gift he has given you everything why else would the Prophet say that Islam was the greatest blessing for him do you know that the Prophet himself when he was searching, <laughs> when he was searching, do you know what he used to do? You read this here. You know that the Prophet used to go himself and meditate when he was a young man. Why was he meditating? There was something inside of him. There was something in him. There were burning questions. He looked at his society critically. And he said that there's something. And he used to go to the cave of Hira in Mecca and meditate. The same way that you may sometimes have inside of you a burning desire for the truth. What is the truth of reality? Not, in, not what is reality as mom might have told you, or dad, or uncle, so and so, or your boys, your friends, society, television, the movies. No, what is life really about? That's a burning question. Prophet Muhammad sallam, had this burning question. In fact, all of the prophets did. Allah tells you this in the Quran about Prophet Ibrahim. One of the mysteries that Prophet Ibrahim tried to unravel was the mystery of how things came into existence. And so he had a burning question. What was the burning question? Allah tells us in the Quran about that burning question. So Ibrahim knew that there was a God. No no question about that. He knew that this God was worthy of worship, but he had some questions. How 
does life come to thee? How do you resurrect the dead? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Awalam took me? What's the case? You don't believe that I can resurrect the dead? Ibrahim said, Bala, of course I believe that. Walakin liyatma inna qalbi. But inside of my heart is this burning question. I want to know. In many ways, you are like Prophet Ibrahim. Inside of you and inside of me is a burning question. And part of how we look at the prophets and their example, the example of the prophets, is to show us the way. The way to what? The way to answering the burning questions. Because you have burning questions inside of you. And the Prophet didn't just tell us what to do. He showed us how to do it. This is why we must cherish his example, his sunnah. We must honor it. We must broaden our understanding of what the sunnah is. Today it's very easy for folk to say, you know, they're practicing the sunnah. Very easy. I know in Philly we have this thing now where I talk to some of the brothers and sisters, and today, all it takes to be a Muslim today is to keep a halal diet, eat halal meat, and wear some clothes, wear some clothes, and for our brothers to grow the beards, and for the sisters maybe to put on the car, and that qualifies you. Those are now the ideals for membership. Those are now the standards. And what happened to the way of the Prophet Wasallam? Because it is a fact proven by history, proven by time, that the Prophet impacted people like Abu Bakr, who did more than change his clothes. In fact, he didn't change his clothes. Abu Bakr didn't change his clothes because his clothes at the time were the clothes that you wore. Abu Bakr didn't change a lot of external stuff. He made adjustments. But what did Abu Bakr change? His heart. Umar changed his heart. Umar went from a dude that was a jerk. Umar went from a dude that was a jerk. That was a knucklehead. And he changed his heart. Someone said him that before he changed his heart, no one could tell him, uh, no, you were wrong. Because if someone dared to tell him he was wrong, I'm going to handle that. He went from that person to a person who, a little old lady, he was giving a speech one time, and a little old lady yelled out from the back of the room, who do you think you are? You're the big bad Umar? <coughs> well, this is what I know. And Umar said, to paraphrase, Asabat al-Mara'a wa akhtar Umar. Umar was wrong, and my old lady was right. These anecdotes prove that you have to do some investing in your soul. Because otherwise, Islam if you make it, if you reduce it to form, movement without conscious thought behind it, without conscious intention, then it's just something that you do. You just show up in a space, you show up for Jummah, you show up for this, you show up for that, but you're not engaged. Your conscious is not engaged. And we have Ramadan coming. And Allah tells us about Ramadan, what? 
كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون. There's a purpose for fasting. And so we should pray that we're not just not eating and not drinking. Because Allah don't need us to do that. Allah don't need us to go on a diet. Allah don't need us to go without food or drink. So he tells us, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And what is taqwa? Taqwa is a consciousness. A spiritual consciousness that you are aware of your responsibility to Allah. That is the purpose of the fast. So that means that we should all have a plan for Ramadan. We should have a plan for Ramadan. How am I preparing for Ramadan? Is a question that you should ask before you start fasting. Otherwise, you just go without food and water. And Ramadan should be prepared for. Because Ramadan, the 29 or 30 days, are an exercise in spiritual discipline. The same way, if you decided today, I'm going to start training for a marathon. I'm going to run 25 miles, 26 miles. What do you do? You train for the marathon. You don't just get up tomorrow morning and run 25 miles. Because if you do that, what happens? You can be in tip-top shape. You can be a built-up brother or sister, you know, buff. You went out there trying to run 20, 26 miles straight without training. On the course of the marathon, psychologically, you encounter all kinds of challenges. Sports physiologists say that there are stages in the marathon where you have to learn to overcome because it's a mental thing. It becomes a mental thing. The body starts responding to the mental. And some say experienced runners, when you can hit the wall and keep going. Well, what is the wall? It's not a physical wall. It's a psychological wall. It's the wall where your, your body says, I can't run another step. I can't take another step. And your willpower says, yes, you can. But Ramadan is like a training camp. With the Eid being the championship. People who want to win, what do they do? They practice. The same way the NBA playoffs are going on now. And the teams that are left. They are the teams that prepared to win. They prepared back in March. They prepared back in, in, in May, last May, to get to where they are now. And the people that rise above, above the others are the ones that put in the extra work. That's for physical discipline. The same logic applies to Spiritual discipline. Some of us want to jump into Ramadan and we're a devil yesterday and we turn into a melodic angel tomorrow. Right? Uh, there's a space. Not literally a devil. Inshallah, <laughs> right? But you understand what my point that we have to do some work. And that's the beauty of Ramadan. But we have to have a plan. I advise people, starting with myself, to think about it. Don't just plan to show up to the mosque for iftars. Don't just plan to show up to the mosque and make extra prayers if you don't even have a plan. Why are you praying extra? Why are you trying to do more? For your soul. Think about it. And remember that Allah doesn't need us to abstain from food or drink. Remember that. Remind yourself. So this is not something that Allah needs you to do. This is something that you need to do for yourself. One of the things, brothers and sisters, 
that's very tangible, very doable, a small, close fruit. As I tell people, if we could practice during the month of Ramadan, identifying every day, Ramadan has 29 or 30 days, and every day you identify three things that you're grateful for. And the only condition is the three things that you identify today, tomorrow you have to identify three different things. And one, I can guarantee you that at the end of the month, you're going to have a list that's compiled of 90 things. If you really think about what you have to be grateful for, you're going to come up with a list of 90 things. Then you take the 90 things and put them in a column. And then you put the problems that you have going on in your life, the challenges, the obstacles. That list is going to be shorter than the 90. So the mathematical equation is the 90 is going to be greater, greater than 10, greater than 20. And if I have 90 things good going for me every day and 20 challenges, Some of us have challenges, maybe one or two, but we make them like they're a hundred. But even if it's just two challenges, you got more good going on in your life than bad. And this is an attitude adjustment. Because the reality of how we live, particularly in this country, in this society, is that we are cozy, and we're comfortable, and we got it good, and the good that we got is never good enough because we want more. But the problem with wanting more is not how to want more. The problem is, if you are not grateful for what you have right now, you don't qualify to get more. Not spiritually. Because there are people, and everyone in the room can relate to this, when I wake up in the morning, when I have in my environment that's good, I have some safety in my environment, I have things, I can look at my kids, and they're good. Know for a fact that there's someone else being tested. You just don't know about it. But know that someone is being tested. A test that Allah spared you from. This is an attitude adjustment. Oftentimes, all it takes is an attitude adjustment. And so that will not only be the time where we invest in making an attitude adjustment. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us during the blessed month of Ramadan. Amen. To give us of the good. Ramadan. Amen. To give us of the mercy of Ramadan. Amen. To give us of the forgiveness of Ramadan. Amen. To protect us all from the hellfire. Amen. So brothers and sisters, we should prepare for Ramadan, even if we're not ready. What that means is sometimes, let's just be real. If your mind can stand in front of you and tell you, be ready for Ramadan, it's a wonderful opportunity, it's a great thing, and you might, you just may not be ready because you got something going on in your life. You may have a problem. Spiritually, you, you may be down. You may not feel good about your situation. And this is all real talk. I mean, we're not robots, we're human beings. Yeah, 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 Sheikh, I hear you, yeah, Ramadan, Ramadan, Ramadan. Man, I, you know, I got this thing going on and I'm just not. But you should prepare for Ramadan anyway. Because part of the blessing of Ramadan is there's so much in the month that even a little bit that you do 
in a moment of despair. is of tremendous benefit. <coughs> Sometimes we feel overburdened. Now I've done so much dirt. I've done so much wrong. Now Ramadan is coming and how can I go to a law like that? <coughs> I had a guy ask me that one time. You should come to Ramadan and stand. He said, love it. How the ministry would be so active at night. He was a Muslim, but he was embarrassed to come into the ministry. So he used to stand down and watch us at the corner. Why are you standing down there, man? Because I can't come in there yet. Yet? What do you mean, yet? No, come on. I can't, I can't come in there yet. You'd be surprised that this is people's state of mind. Law doesn't say don't come in the message yet. Law says come into the message. Right? So in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, And this alone, whoever fasts Ramadan out of sincere faith and anticipates reward from Allah they will have their preceding sins forgiven. This promise alone, this is a promise from the Prophet. <laughs> and he's authorized to say this, that if you fast, Iman, and you believe that you're supposed to fast, and you believe that there's a reward, a tremendous reward, that Allah will wipe your slate clean. That alone should be motivation for you to try to do something. Because we know, we know none of us has a guarantee. And sometimes it's the person that prays a little bit with a big intention, good intention, a big amount of sincerity. Sometimes their prayer is better than the person who prays a lot. The heart ain't right. Because the heart matters. And so we ask Allah Ta'ala to bless us to be inspired. Amen. To bless us, inshallah, to find motivation. Amen. And to bless us to make intentions to get the best out of the month of Ramadan. Amen. And Allah Ta'ala accept our efforts, accept Amen. our fasting. Amen. And Allah accept our recitation of Quran. Amen. Allah accept our prayer. Amen. Our prayer. Amen. And may Allah Ta'ala bless us and bless our families. Amen. And keep us all on the straight path. Amen. Allah wa sallu ala Sayyidina Musaleena wa Imam al-Muttaqeen. فقال أمركم الله بذلك في كتابه العزيز وقال جل من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما ويقول عليه يقول الصلاة والتسليم وصلى عليه مرة صلى الله عليه بها عشرة اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك نبينا محمد رضي الله عن الصحابة والتابعين ومن تبع هديهم وهداهم إلى يوم الدين رضى الله عنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم ورب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس ليوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإنتاء بالقربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وذكر الله لا يذكركم واشكروا على نعمه يجدكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر الله يعلم ما تصنعون وقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة وقد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله